so we will begin our program now. Welcome everyone to the first event in our 2021-2022 History Talk Speaker Series. My name is Felicia Rova Cameron and I am the Museum Assistant and Educator. This evening, I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. The museum is on the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Nisqually and Squaxin Island peoples. Lacey and the South Puget Sound region are encompassed by the Treaty of Medicine Creek, signed under duress in 1854. We respect and affirm tribal sovereignty, and as part of the city of Lacey, we work with the Nisqually and Squaxin Island tribes in government-to-government -government partnership. All right, and so next slide. Before we begin the program, I'd like to share a variety of museum news. The museum was closed for a little over a year due to the pandemic, but we are now open to the public again. Museum hours are Thursday and Friday, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. and Saturday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, we have been delighted to see people in the museum again and have provided tours for guests that have stopped by. Okay, next slide. Along with the museum being open again, we are continuing to accept artifacts for donations, working on making collections accessible and helping customers with their research inquiries, among many other things. We are also working on a project to document this time that we have been going through. We are asking people to submit their photos and share what they've been doing during the pandemic. So here on this slide are a couple of examples. The photo on the left was submitted by Cynthia Pratt and it's a mask she created for family and friends. Just, on the right, submitted by Jennifer Reffner, is a photo from their time spent out. Does, if it does rain, just come in and get it. We'd love to have more, so please send in your photos. That's okay. Next slide. As the summer season is winding down, I want to remind everyone that the depot will uh, be closed for the season at the end of September. The playground will continue to be open year round. The depot will be open again in May and is available to book for events. All right, and next slide. The depot and playground are part of what will become the whole museum campus. Here is one of our latest renderings of the new museum. We received a second grant to get the museum site ready for construction and the contract is in the works now and we expect to begin that work in the first quarter of 2022. Okay, and next slide. Before we begin, I would like to share with you the next speaker in our History Talk series. On Tuesday, October 12th at 6.30 p.m., our speaker will be Annette Bullchild, the Scully Tribe Archives and Tribal Historic Preservation Officer Director. In the presentation titled, The Scully Tribe History and Conversation, Annette will share a bit of history of the tribe and afterwards she would like to answer questions from the audience about what they would like to know about the tribe. So we invite you all to join us for this unique dialogue. We are still hoping to have this as an in-person and online hybrid program, um, but we will have to see what the policies are um, and what policies are in place as we get closer. So keep an eye on our website and Facebook for more information. Like with our past history talks, you can register for future programs when they become available by going to our website at laceymuseum.org and then click on events. Alternatively, you can visit the City of Lacey Facebook page where all of our speaker events are posted. Lastly, for those of you who have come to see our in-person history talks, you'll know that the Q&A portion of the talk is definitely a highlight and we would like to keep that portion going. So this evening's Zoom meeting is set up webinar style. Um, so there is not a chat box like in regular Zoom meetings. We do have a Q&A button, which for most of you will be at the bottom of your screen. Um, for the most part, we'll be holding questions until the end, but anytime you do have questions, go ahead and post it in the Q&A section and we'll circle back around to it at the end. Okay, and next slide. So now let me introduce our speaker for tonight, David Nicandri. David Nicandri is the former director of the Washington State Historical Society, having served in that capacity from 1987 to 2011 uh, when he retired. The new Washington State His History Museum in downtown Tacoma, now 25 years old, was his signature achievement. In the last decade, he has authored three books, River of Promise, Lewis and Clark on the Columbia, Lewis and Clark Reframed, Examining Ties to Cook, Vancouver, and Mackenzie, and the subject of tonight's presentation, Captain Cook Rediscovered, Voyaging to the Icy Latitudes. 
Dave has three other books in various stages of development. The first is Discovering Nothing, Captain Cook and the Evolution of the Pacific Portal to the Northwest Passage, currently under review, peer review by UBC Press. The second book is Exploring Northwestern Explorers from Fuca to Fremont. And the third book is The Northwest and Other Passages, Tales from the North. So Dave, thank you so much for joining us and we are honored to have you speak with us today. Well, thank you, uh, Felicia, and uh, thank you to the uh, Lacey Museum uh, for this invitation and congratulations on uh, uh, the great progress you're making on the new museum. It'll be a marvelous contribution to the uh, broader metropolitan area, and, uh, and I know uh, everyone in the community will look forward to its completion. I'd also like to thank uh, my graphic design assistant, Darlene Kemery, who will be assisting me tonight, uh, 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 flipping through about 15 or 16 slides, which will form the backbone uh, for my program. So my thanks to Darlene as well. And with that, Darlene, I think we can go to the first slide. Okay, let me share the screen. Open this up. Uh, this is the uh, cover uh, to my book and just a few summary, quick summary comments about this. Um, uh, Captain Cook is uh, best known as a tropical navigator. Um, he's, he died in Hawaii. If there's one thing people know about Cook, that's probably it. Very few books have been written about Captain Cook from a North American vantage point. Most writers who specialize on Cook are either from Great Britain or Australia and New Zealand. And, uh, and I'm gonna be talking mostly about Cook's third voyage and in the literature of Cook, uh, it's actually his first and second voyages that uh, get most of the attention. So with that as a quick overview, let's go to the first slide. First interpretive slide. Cook started out in the coal trade uh, in Great Britain, uh, the middle of the uh, uh, 18th century. In the, mid in the mid 1750s, he joined the Royal Navy. It was kind of a lateral move, but it happened to coincide with the outbreak of what in Europe was known as the Seven Years' War, but in North America, it's known as the French and Indian War. And as a sailing master aboard one of the numerous ships in the British fleet, uh, Cook created this chart of the St. Lawrence River at the entire length of it. This is a segment just below the Citadel at Quebec, the battle for Quebec in 1759 being the pivotal battle in North America during that campaign. And more particularly still, Cook uh, uh, plotted uh, uh, or, or sounded the depths and the shoals and the uh, navigational hazards in the St. Lawrence River that allowed the sizable British fleet to get past the Narrows to the backside of the Quebec Citadel and uh, leading to um, uh, General Wolfe's victory over Montcalm, uh, as I said, in 1759. Next slide. After the French were uh, conquered, uh, the British set about incorporating their new North American holdings into their empire. Cook, in, uh, in particular, was assigned the duty of creating an authoritative chart of the island of Newfoundland, shown here. This is a composite of all of his summer work over the course of six or seven summers. In the winter, he'd go back to England, refine his chart. After, after he left on his first voyage to the Pacific, this composite view of a very vexatious coastline was, uh, was completed. Um, uh, and this uh, is what that was this cartographic work culminating in kind of a sidebar experiment. Cook recorded a, um, uh, a solar eclipse one summer uh, in Newfoundland. And th it was this work in particular that brought Cook to the attention of senior officials in, British, in the British Admiralty who were on the verge of, an, of a major uh, expansion of British scientific exploration into the Pacific in the late 1760s. Next slide. 
Cook wasn't the first explorer in the South Pacific, of course, but he was he was the one that kind of popularized it as a as a travel and exploration destination. One of his immediate predecessors, Bougainville from France, uh, composed this chart at the end of his voyage in the year or two before Cook got there in 1769. I, I provide this map here just for purposes of contrast. Bougainville was considered a major step up in Enlightenment era geography, his comprehension of the Pacific. But remember this image and pay particular attention to, and you can see it there, the west, the western third, the western half of Australia. Uh, you can see kind of at the, up in the left-hand corner, you can see uh, uh, part of China and what's now Indonesia. But remember this map because this is what the trot, which is this is what the geography of the Pacific, South Pacific in particular, looked like before Cook ventured into that region. Next slide. Um, Cook was uh, was sent to Tahiti uh, in, in Polynesia to observe the transit of Venus. That's where the solar eclipse factored in. This was a rare astronomical event that uh, uh, it's a very it was a co very complicated formula that enabled uh, mathematicians by timing the, the passage of Venus across the face of the sun one could determine uh, the distance of Earth from the sun, for example, 93 million miles and other, and other astronomical events. And at the, at the conclusion of that voyage, Cook was sent back to the Southern Hemisphere for his second voyage in search of Terra Australis Incognita, which is Latin for the unknown Southern continent. Uh, over the course of uh, 1772 to 1775, he intermittently surveyed uh, in the high latitudes of the Indian Pacific and Atlantic Ocean, looking for this mythical southern continent. He only found such as you see here, icebergs and vast expanses of open water in all three oceans. Next slide. Remarkable as it may seem to our modern sense of things. At the time, that is to say in the middle of the 18th century, it was believed that the ice one saw in the high polar latitudes of either the North or Southern hemisphere did not freeze in place, but they were an outflow from continental river systems uh, because it was thought that salt water at great depth uh, far away from land could not freeze. Uh, this, of course, we, we know not to be the case. And there was an even crazier version of that, which is that at the poles, the North and South Pole, that the water there did not even freeze over, which, of course, uh, we know not to be the case. But crisscrossing the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the, Indi uh, and the Indian Ocean, uh, Cook didn't see any land from which icebergs and low, flat pack ice could have emerged, so he he completely altered the concept of sea ice formation because he, he deduced correctly, since there was no land, the ice had to originate in place. That was certainly the case of, uh, of low pack ice, the, the packed ice, uh, but it was also true in the case of, uh, of icebergs, such as you see here, but with a slightly different twist, which we can get into with the next slide. Please, Darlene. Cook's great epiphany off of the island of South Georgia, which is southeast of Cape Horn in the Southern Atlantic Ocean on the last year of his three-year voyage, he came to this island, which was completely encrusted with ice. Now, South Georgia is famous in exploration history because this is the island that Ernest Shackleton sailed to to find help for his wrecked sailors who were on Elephant Island uh, uh, near the Antarctic Peninsula early in the 20th century. And Shackleton glissaded down one of the glaciers, which you cut the kind of what you see here in the center of this image. Uh, in, uh, and, and that's why South Georgia is famous. But South Georgia was actually discovered by Cook and completely encrusted by ice. And it was there that Cook actually saw glaciers break off, calving off from the face 
of the ice sheet. And that's when he deduced that the innumerable icebergs one saw uh, floating in the Southern Indian Pacific and Atlantic Ocean had to be carved off from land. Uh, and there had to be more land than South Georgia represented because there were too many icebergs to account for it otherwise. And that's why Cook was the first to hypothesize that there had, there had to be a large continent at the pole because that was the only way by, by which the thousands of icebergs in the Southern Ocean could have originated. And that the, the, science, the science of sea ice formation and glaciology and the theory of a Southern polar continent were all a function of Cook's second voyage. Next slide. And this was clear, this was without doubt the most exotic place that Cook saw on his uh, second voyage. These are the, this was the South, one of the South Sandwich Islands and the island that Cook called Southern Thule, uh, which is a, a Thule being a, 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 an apocryphal legendary place for the most extreme place on earth. It went back to the classical era. And this was the most Southern, Southern land ever discerned not only by any European, but any, any voyager of any ancestry up to that point in time, again in 1775. Cook, next slide please, darling. Cook returned to uh, Great Britain to great acclaim uh, and actually for a while retired to the administration of a, of a, of a, a hospital for uh, sea, uh, for uh, sick sailors and disabled seamen, et cetera, but was brought back out of retirement for a third and what would prove to be his final voyage looking for the Northwest Passage. Uh, the Northwest Passage then was the third of the great Enlightenment era geographic quests. There was the transit of Venus that, uh, that explorers went to all corners of the earth to try to site in order to get their plots for that complicated mathematical uh, uh, proposition. Then there was the question of Terra Australis Incognita, the great Southern continent, which Cook proved by the process of negative discovery that didn't exist. The Northwest Passage was the third, third great mystery. Now what you see on your screen here is a map that, was, that appeared in print shortly before Cook's third voyage. Uh, the Bering Strait, as rough, very roughly defined, is in the center of the image, just below the crest or the shield at the top. But I call your attention in particular to <clears throat> what looks like a large opening or indent or bay of open water uh, to the east of the Pacific Ocean that was, in a sense, an analog to what Hudson Bay is as an inlet off of the uh, uh, Atlantic Ocean. This might also be an image trying try to take a mental memory of because I'll, I'll, I'll refer uh, back to this image later on. But the long and the short of it and the point of my showing this slide, and all of these illustrations, by the way, are in the book in question, is to give you some sense of the nature, scale, and scope of geographic comprehension of North America and the North Pacific more generally before Cook sailed there in 1778. Next slide. There were other projections in the, in the run up to Cook's third and final voyage. And he left, by the way, uh, in the second week of July in 1776. Indeed, in the neighboring slips to where he was in Plymouth, he saw Hessians loading on British transport to go over the Atlantic to suppress the rebellion that had broken out uh, in, the, in the spring of 1775. Uh, but this map you see here is, is actually one of Russian origin. Uh, this was a map published uh, uh, attempting to delineate the track of, of Vitus Bering's voyages from, uh, from the Far East Cape of Asia towards uh, North America. And what's worth noting here is the uh, almost elephantine uh, extension, uh, 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 the, like the trunk of an elephant, off of the head of North America, actually extending almost, uh, in fact, e even tucking underneath the easternmost extent 
of the far point, far point, east point of, uh, of Asia. That was um, a, a, a projection uh, from the 1760s. And with the next slide is almost the reversal of that image. And in fact, this was the most recent map of the North Pacific published in 1774, two years before Cook voyaged into the Northern Hemisphere. In this image, that great extent, that elephantine extension of Alaska has been pulverized into this uh, 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 probably rough allusion to, uh, to the Aleutian change. Uh, but it's interesting to note that the largest of these islands, just to the east of the Far East Cape of Siberia, of Russia today, is an island called Alaska, which is the origin of the modern place name of Alaska, which um, uh, Cook would, would do much to define with far greater precision during his third and final voyage. Next slide, please, Darlene. Now, Cook sailed along the Oregon and Washington coasts in the uh, spring of 1778, but did not make landfall. He's been much criticized by that by regional historians who have wondered, uh, you know, why didn't he see the Columbia River? How could he have missed the Strait of Juan de Fuca? It's important to note, however, that uh, explorers for the Hudson Bay Company operating out of Hudson Bay had trekked overland all the way to the Arctic Ocean to about 70 degrees north and they would have walked over any Northwest Passage if one existed in, in those latitudes. And of course there wasn't. And so for that reason, the British Admiralty told Cook, make landfall on the Northwest coast of America, somewhere in the forties of Northern latitude, get refresh your stock of wood and water, and then proceed to where the real discovery zone was, which was presumed to be in the 60s, the high 60s, maybe even 70 degrees latitude north. And so therefore this place, Nootka Sound, uh, on the west coast of what was later to be perceived as Vancouver Island, was Cook's only landfall in the Pacific Northwest as we generally conceive it during the course of his third voyage. Next slide. Cook, kept the um, North American shore off to a starboard uh, all the way north past uh, what's now the panhandle or the inside passage uh, part of Alaska, finally seeing broad openings in the, in the terrain uh, at Prince William Sound seen on the right and what was later named Cook Inlet seen on the left of this image. These of course are not openings to the Northwest Passage, they're bays or inlets by definition. Uh, and Cook explored both, again, uh, having gotten to the discovery zone, this is about 61 degrees north, both of these, Anchorage is about 61 degrees north. So here Cook began probing in more detail, more comprehensively, unlike quickly passing by again, the Columbia River in the Strait of Juan de Fuca, which he knew by definition would be dead ends. This he did not know by, these he did not know by definition would be dead ends. But this, uh, this composite map here, Prince William Sound and Cook Inlet is actually some of the best cartography to be found in any of Cook's three voyages, which is a point I emphasize because one of the legends uh, that's grown up around Cook scholarship is that Cook had kind of become a worn out explorer uh, he wasn't, he didn't have the vigor and the thoroughness that he had displayed on his earlier uh, voyages. Uh, but the cartography you see here uh, puts a lie to it as does, as do subsequent events uh, from this point in the story, which I'll turn to with the next slide. Cook was a bit, a, eventually able to find a slot through the Aleutian chain and transited the Bering Strait between North America and the East Cape of, uh, of Asia. In fact, he was the first to delineate that cartographically and actually started to bend his way north across the top of Alaska as we conceive it today before he encountered the ice which stymied him. And perhaps a good thing because if he had been able to get much farther than he got, 
which was icy cape, not quite to the top where Barrow and Prudhoe Bay are, but more on the northwestern side, uh, but still in the Arct on the Arctic side of Alaska, where his ships, uh, Resolution and Discovery that you see here, uh, met the ice and he could, he could go no farther. Uh, the, the, the idea was to get to about 70 degrees north and presume that there might even, that might not be, the sea might not be full of ice. Uh, but actually, Cook actually met ice at a lower latitude in the north than he did in the south, which is why he was somewhat surprised. Uh, this image is also noteworthy because on the right, that, that little huddle of, uh, of, 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 of animals is actually a, a set of walruses. Uh, Cook re rather innovatively used the barking sound of the walruses and the fog that is not displayed here, but sailing in the Arctic in the summertime, as he did in 1778, could be frequently drizzly, foggy, and Cook could always tell how close he was to the ice edge by listening to the barking of the walruses that you see here to the right of this image. Next slide. Now, a truly fatigued explorer, which Cook was not, probably would have headed home uh, at the end of, of his uh, second year at sea, actually third, 70, left in 76, 77, 1777 was a staging year in the South Pacific. And then in 1778, he actually got to the uh, discovery zone depicted here, again, Bering Strait, Asia on the left, North America on the right. That scratching, uh, the somewhat indistinct markings you see on this map is actually a plot of Cook's track once he got through Bering Strait and was actually sailing along the Arctic ice edge around the 70th parallel, uh, which is the top line running horizontally across the image. You can see Cook actually got higher than 70 degrees north. Now, this image is interesting, uh, and I talk about this at great length in my book. Cook hits the ice at the far right, top right in this image, but rather than just simply leaving the Arctic, heading back out Bering Strait, what this map shows is his track eastward about a tenth of the way atop the Asian continent. And I write in the book that actually if Cook hadn't also met ice there, he might have tried to sail back to England by going atop Russia all the way to the North Sea and then back home to England. But he hit ice there, and finally, I hit he with with uh, with the with fall and winter, which come almost come upon the North almost simultaneously. In the first week of September, seventeen seventy eight, he had to leave the Arctic, and he sailed south for his uh, uh, overwintering spot. Hawaii, which we can see on the next slide. I'm sorry, this slide, I apologize. Uh, I, I include this slide, which is an inset from the master map, which you'll see in detail at the end of this presentation. I call your attention, although the captioning tends to obscure it, unfortunately, uh, but Southwest of, of uh, South America, uh, you can see, uh, and I will stop for a second so the captioning uh, will, will, will make, at least on my screen, the captioning obscures it. The uh, Cook's farthest southern point on the second expedition it was, is representative of his typical approach, which is to take a deep dive south and then quickly go back north to the more temperate latitudes because his crew was getting fatigued, needed to warm up. Uh, but this is not the path Cook applied on his third voyage, he stayed along the ice edge for 20 degrees of latitude, I'm sorry, longitude, not just a quick needle noise deep dive that you see here, and I will stop so you can see it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, the captioning still there. Oh, there you, there, perhaps you saw it for a while. Okay, next People slide. Can I don't mean to interrupt, Dave, but folks can also uh, turn off the captioning if they would like to. Oh, so. thank you. Um, and perhaps most have. I'm sorry if I belabored that point. So we're almost done. So the next slide 
is uh, Cook's chart of the Hawaiian Islands. Now, among Cook's numerous and famous discoveries, perhaps none is more significant or better known than the Hawaiian chain. Of course, Cook was not the first discoverer of Hawaii. Uh, indigenous Polynesians had probably uh, made it to the islands about a thousand years before uh, uh, Cook got there. Cook, of course, was the first to chart them in the details such as you see here. Cook was killed on the large island of Hawaii, or Owyhee, as it's delineated here in this chart, uh, at, in, on uh, February 14th, 1779. One might think of it as the original St. Valentine's Day massacre. Uh, that's perhaps a poor attempt at humor. The larger point about this chart, I call your attention to the zigzag path. You can see kind of the ups and down, the sharp angular turns of Cook's track off the northeast or the Hilo uh, Bay side of the island and uh, around to the southern point and then Kealakekua Bay where Cook was killed, which is on about uh, uh, the midway point on the west side. Hawaii, the big island's roughly triangular. Cook approached the big island on the, uh, on the, on the northeast side, rounded the southern point, was coming up the west when he finally found the first harbor of note Kealakekua Bay, where he ended up getting killed. Um, I only emphasize his track here uh, because, uh, uh, and I go probably, uh, some might think of too much detail on this in my book, but Cook is, Cook's track around Hawaii has been much criticized by later scholars because they think he was trying to avoid landing. Actually, the weather was very tumultuous. He was just simply looking for a, a good harbor, finally found one, but it was there that he was killed um, uh, in uh, February of 1779. So we'll go to the next slide, which I think might also be our last one. So the Admiralty at the end, at the conclusion of Cook's third voyage, published the account of same in 1784 and included in it, although not the colorized version you see here, was a master map of the world that included Cook's track, which you can perhaps see in some detail on your screen. Now, this map, I argue in my book, is actually the first modern map of the world in that it's got all of the continents uh, roughly uh, 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 appropriately spaced from one another, particularly the very broad dimension of the Pacific Ocean. And all of the major landforms, if one looks at this map, you, you would look at it and say, yeah, that, that's the map of the way the world looks. Now, there are anomalies. Uh, Tasmania off the southern coast of Australia, called New Holland and Cook's map, is not, is not correctly detailed. The Korean Peninsula and the, and the Japanese islands are not, are not specified in great detail. Whole, uh, the Alaska subcontinent is still oversized, but it, it looks closer to what it actually looks like than those charts that preceded uh, Cook that I showed earlier in the presentation. And the, uh, co the coast of the northwest coast of North America looks like a straight edge, more or less. Of course, it's a far more complicated coastline than that. But again, the northwest coast of North America, contrary to the presumption of many regional historians here in the Pacific Northwest was not the focus of Cook's third mission. It was the high latitudes in the North Pacific, not the temperate latitudes that we inhabit were Cook's focus for his third voyage. In any event, this map is a path, is a monumental epic making depiction of the geography of the globe and not the Cook made uh, del uh, discerned all of this complexity, but at his behest, he commissioned this map actually while he was on the third voyage, uh, and it was published after, after his death uh, in 1784. It is, as I said at the outset, the first modern map of the world and perhaps the best emblem possible to conclude uh, the formal part uh, of my presentation, except for the last slide, which of course is the pitch, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, the book uh, is currently available from the University of British Columbia Press. There's a few testimonials there. We can leave that up for a while. You can also order the book on Amazon. And for those of you who feel uh, 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 so inclined, um, I have coffee at Dancing Goats uh, uh, a coffee shop opposite the Transit Center in Lacey every Wednesday morning at nine, from 9.30 to 10.30. Uh, with uh, Ken Balsley, famous uh, Lacey historian, and Dick Poos, now also not only a famous radio personality, but a historian in his own right. I'm there every Wednesday morning. I'd be happy to sell you a book in person or autograph one if you buy it through some other means. So at that point, at this point, I think I'll take a breath and ask if there are any questions. Again, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Special thanks again to the Lacey Museum and my assistant, Darlene Kemery. Thank you, Dave. That was such an interesting talk. I found it very clever that Cook used the barking sounds of the walruses to figure out how close to the ice he was. I had um, a little giggle at that. Um, we are now going to take questions. So as a reminder, we do have the Q&A button, um, which for most of you will be at the bottom of your screen and you'll be able to type out questions and I will read them off for Dave. Um, I had one question. I was following along and taking notes, but I think I missed it there. You mentioned that um, Cook was looking for um, the unknown Southern continent, but found icebergs. What, what um, time period was that in again? Well, all the way back to the classical period, and I, I kind of did slip over that a little bit, going all the way back to the classical period, roughly approximate to the size of Eurasia in the Northern Hemisphere to balance out the rotation of the globe. In other words, they thought that if there wasn't a landmass like Eurasia down there, the earth would wobble on its axis. And so since it obviously wasn't wobbling, there had to be land. We just simply need to get somebody to go down there and look for it. So hypothetical projections uh, th uh, throughout the, from the classical period forward through the Renaissance into the early enlightenment postulated the existence of a Southern continent that, that well, explorers would, would, would run into like the Northern tip of New Zealand or the West coast of Australia or, or Easter Island or these various, and they would always presume that that was the northernmost promontory of a bigger continent that lay to the, in the southern latitudes to the south of it. Again, because of this principle of counterpoise was, was the fancy way of thinking of it, the, the balancing mechanism. Uh, but in fact, there is no southern continent. It's largely a, a, a huge expanse of water and by crisscrossing the Indian, Pacific, and Atlantic Oceans in that order, Cook proved there was no Eurasian analog in the Southern Hemisphere. But just to tie up the perhaps loose ends, he didn't find land, but he found lots of ice, icebergs and low-lying pack ice. And that's what led to his logic model about where is all this ice coming from? And that led to the kind of contrary postulate uh, postulation, which is there might be a southern continent, but it had to be at the poles, at the pole frozen over. And that's what the pack ice is attached to. And that's where the icebergs come. And in that sense, Cook was correct. He was, as I say in this book, completely contrary to form, the first polar explorer. Thank you. So it looks like we have questions in chat now. The first one here um, is, it says, what type of person was Cook? So I'm assuming in your research, um, if you had um, found yes. that out. Okay, is that the full question, Felicia? Yeah, it was. What type of uh, person was Cook? Um, Cook was a taskmaster, as any naval captain in that era and beyond was. He could be difficult to be around, but he, all, he was always very conscious of what I would call a stewardship responsibility for the men under his charge, that they were, uh, that they were healthy, that they, that they received fresh food. I mean, among Cook's other contributions is that he was such a stickler for stopping and getting fresh water, greens, 
uh, not relying on, on uh, biscuit and salted pork and salted beef. Uh, he was so it was such a stickler for fresh pr provisions that he kind of innovated. I mean, prior to cook, half or more of a crew on a, on a long distance cruise like Cook took, the crew would die from scurvy and other diseases. So Cook was was very faithful to his charge in that respect. Uh, he was also, I think the other predominant characteristic is that he was very faithful to mission. Uh, he, he, he knew what his orders were and he followed them very faithfully. In fact, that's, what, that's why Cook gets into trouble with modern historians. They want Cook to engage in the expedition they would want to do, not the expedition Cook was charged with taking with, uh, at the behest of the Admiralty. So Cook, he was, he was gritty. Uh, everyone else on board would get tired of exploring before Cook would. The guy was ineffable. He was indefatigable. He had great endurance. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so I think those are some of the, tip of, that's how I would typify and give some character to Cook as a man. Okay, thank you. This next question says, in your book, is there any relationship between quote errors in the map and what was happening on board as recorded in the ship's log, hardships, et cetera? Uh, uh, yes, I, I, uh, I, I personally, I think it's important when you're writing a travel account or a history of several travel accounts, which is what this book is, that you bring the reader along uh, and uh, uh, identify, uh, the book's got uh, very useful maps where one can compare the story with a visual image of where Cook is at any one time. Um, Cook uh, was not faultless, he would make mistakes, but, and this, this gets back to the question about Cook as a person. Whenever he found a mistake, he was not ambivalent about correcting it and going on the record to the fact that he was correcting something that he had mistaken on an earlier voyage. Of course, he could only do that, and I didn't have time to go into it in my main remarks. Cook visited several places several times. His favorite haunt, if you will, was Cook Strait between the Northern and Southern Island of New Zealand. Tahiti was another one. And it was frequently to those latitudes Cook would go between Southern ice exploring seasons or uh, continent hunting uh, seasons. So Cook was not faultless, but he had, uh, but he, uh, but when he had a chance to acknowledge that he'd made a previous error, he always fessed up to it and corrected the record, which is why the map, which is also the one over my shoulder, by the way, uh, which is why it proved to be uh, so faithful to our modern sensibility of the world's geography as it is. Okay, our next question asks, is there any recognition of Cook in Hawaii, a plaque or monument, or was he somewhat of a hated person there? Well, Cook's a very controversial figure these days, and um, uh, his, his reputation's taken a great beating, and of course, many folks in the region would, uh, would recognize or would remember that a statue of Cook uh, in, in Victoria Harbor, just up north in British Columbia, was toppled. Um, uh, in, in uh, early July. So here's what I'll say about that. Cook, like any person, and I've already said this, uh, had his faults and foibles. Um, uh, and, and there were a couple of occasions during the course of his uh, expeditions to the Pacific where there were violent encounters with indigenous people. He always regretted those when they happened and tried to avoid or minimize them uh, as best he could. But here's the larger point. Um, Cook, uh, the, here's what I wanna say. Cook was, I think, famous and is a, is a figure that, although we ought to recognize his faults, we also ought to recognize his contributions. And one of his contributions is the fact that Cook, although he felt he was coming from, from his estimation of virtually all of his peers in Europe, a superior civilization, 
When he encountered indigenous people in Australia and in Polynesia generally, he was quite conscious of the attributes and values, and in some cases, superior values to his own sense of his own culture when he encountered it. And he famously at one point says, uh, as, he, as he sees the effect that the encounter has had on uh, Polynesian people, uh, he, he bemoans the fact that the, the regular contact with European people is, is, uh, is leveling a, a steep toll on, on indigenous culture. And he says, I think quite adroitly in his, his account, if anyone doubts the truth of what I say, just look at what the constant encounter of the indigenous people of North America with Europeans has gained them. The point I'm, I'm really trying to make is this. Western civil, the, the modern sensibilities of modern culture, pluralism, appreciation of diversity, the autonomous value of, uh, uh, and, and of other cultures, that's not an invention of modern scholarship. There are benchmarks along the way where Western civilization improved its sense of its place in the world. Uh, and the, these, these attributes, pluralism, diversity, I mean, Western civilization did not make a leap from the barbarism of the Middle Ages to the postmodern 21st century in a single leap. There are way stations along the way, and Cook was a very important figure in that regard because he popularized the value, the autonomous value of these indigenous cultures wherever he saw them. And, one, and, and in one regard, Cook has gotten a very bad rep because I've seen people say that he renamed places all over the world. He gave them names after admirals and noblemen and, 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 and naval officials, and it's true. But if Cook knew the name, uh, an indigenous name for a place, he always applied it to his charts of that place, um, including Kealakekua Bay, the place where he was killed in Hawaii. Thank you. This next question asks, how close did Cook get to Antarctica? Cook got within 70 miles of Antarctica, 70 to 100 miles southwest of Cape Horn, Tierra del Fuego, the southern tip of, um, of South America. And no one beat Cook's southern latitude, by the way, which was 71 degrees south and change. His highest north was 70 degrees north and change. No one beat Cook's southern latitude because he reached farther south in February 1775. It was not until 1823 that a um, whaler, a British whaler, exceeded that mark, and um, and his, and his uh, and that and even that was on the uh, on the east side of the Antarctic Peninsula. No one actually exceeded Cook's latitude on the Pacific side. Of, uh, of Cape Horn until the 1840s. Okay, this next question asks, did Cook explore all the Sandwich Islands before being killed on the Big Island? Okay, uh, no, uh, Cook actually ran in, uh, and I need to be careful about this because the word discovered uh, is problematic. Cook first encountered the Hawaiian Islands on his way north from the Southern Hemisphere, Tahiti, New Zealand, where he had staged over the course of uh, 17, uh, the winter of uh, 1776, uh, 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 I'm sorry, 1777, 78. So he was tracking north from Tahiti. And uh, the fact he asked the Tahitians, are there any islands north of here? Because he was going to sail north from Tahiti and then catch the well-known uh, westerlies in the North Pacific that he knew from other exploring accounts would take him to the west coast of North America. And so he crosses the, e the uh, equator and but 10 degrees north of there, he runs into this chain of islands. What we know as the Hawaiian Islands, which he called at the time the Sandwich Islands after the first Lord of the Admiralty, his uh, sponsor, Lord Sandwich. Uh, so Cook encounters them in January 1778, does a rough survey of Kauai, 
which is the island he first hit, saw Maui, but he was on a mission at that point. He, he had to get to the west coast of North America by March so he could refresh and re resupply his wood to keep the food in the, you know, the ovens and because uh, they're going to the polar region again. They need wood for heat, et cetera. Uh, and so he's on a, so he's on his way north, runs into the Hawaiian Islands. But of course, as is as would have been true for anyone who encountered them, including most, if not all of us, the Hawaiian Islands make a strong impression on you, when you uh, as 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 indeed do uh, as most South Pacific islands do, quite honestly. And so after Cook hit the ice north of Alaska, his instructions had actually advised going to Kamchatka the port of Petropavlovsk, which is on the west side of Kamchatka, which was Bering's point of departure in the 1740s. It was the only northern water port that the British Admiralty knew of, and Cook was the tied over there, uh, which would have been a dismal place to spend the winter, uh, uh, perhaps for him personally better than Hawaii, where he ended up getting killed, but it would have been miserable for everyone. So having encountered the Hawaiian Islands on the way north in 1778, after meeting the Arctic ice pack, he goes back to the Hawaiian Islands, starts the more detailed survey, the results of which you saw in that one slide, and it's on his uh, trip up the west coast of the Big Island that he was killed. All right, this next question asks, what happened to the crew after he was killed? Well, um, so his second in command was a fellow by the name of Charles Clark. Uh, it sounds like William Clark, no relations, but it's spelled C-L-E-R-K-E, -E, Charles Clark, who, as it should happen, had contracted tuberculosis before he left. Uh, and in fact, even before they went north the first time, Clark asked Cook if he could stay in the warm, uh, salubrious climate of the tropical zone because he had the feeling that if he went north, it would kill him. And of course, in the 20th century, one of the treatments for tuberculosis was to send people like to Arizona because the, the warm, dry climate uh, helped your breathing capability. So Clark wanted to he begged off, but Cook said, Cook said, no, you gotta go. And so he did. Uh, so the, he went north the first time, Cook's get, Cook gets killed. Now at this point, Clark, he's the commander. He can go home if he wants to. But, in the, but, but and this speaks to the question about Cook's personality. Cook had so inculcated a sense of mission among Clark and the broader crew of the two ships that they went north a second year largely with the same result. Of course, the ice pack, I mean, today, of course, if Cook sailed up there, he, he might have been able to get through, not only through the Canadian archipelago, but over the top of Russia, because those waters are now open and ice-free seasonally, that is to say, in the northern summer. So Clerk goes back north, and as he had intuited, the cold weather kills Clark, uh, as he returns to Petropavlos, and then a fellow by the name of John Gore, who was a lieutenant, accedes to the role of captain, and it's Gore who takes the expedition home over the course of 1779-1780. But here's the thing. On the way back home, in the what was then known as the ports of Canton and Macau, Macau is still uh, known as such, sea otter pelts that Cook's men had acquired in Nootka Sound as warm weather gear, as not trade items, but as warm weather gear. They discovered they could sell to fur merchants in Canton for a small fortune. In other words, a sailor could have gotten a sea otter pelt at Nootka for a nail, iron being a very prized commodity, virtually everywhere in the Pacific Hemisphere with the indigenous people that Cook met. So for a nail, a sailor could get a sea otter pelt that he could sell in China for $100. Uh, uh, who knows, 10,000 times the value of what it cost to acquire it. And of course, this created a sensation effect. Gore had to fend off a near mutiny because when the sailors discovered that the odds and ends they had in their kit 
they could sell for, for a small fortune. Some of them wanted to go back to the North Pacific and get more furs to, to sell in that market. Uh, but, uh, but in fact, some people did desert, but, Cook, but Gore then got the expedition back in October of 1780, more than four years after Cook left Plymouth in 1776. But again, here's the thing. When the Admiralty account was published in 1784, another junior officer by the name of James King, and I have a whole chapter on this in my book, he wrote a virtual business perspective, prospectus in the Cook Third Voyage account, volume three, the concluding paragraphs, and how English or navigators from any country could capitalize upon this fur trade that Cook's expedition had inadvertently stumbled upon. And I only emphasize this point because the, uh, of all of the encounter elements for indigenous people in the Northwest, without question, the most deleterious was the fur trade era, the 1790s, uh, early 19th century. That's where the real bad stuff, uh, uh, massacres, theft, I mean, just terrible goings on. But my point is, Cook was dismissive of the fur trade. He never thought that this was something that would that sailors from his country could engage in. It was Lieutenant King, after Cook was dead, who published in the Third Voyage account this prospectus of how there was this rich maritime fur trade potential along the Northwest coast. That's what precipitated the great rush of fur trade, maritime fur traders to the Northwest coast the most famous of whom would be, of course, Robert Gray and John Kendrick, the Americans, Gray being the first American to uh, circumnavigate the globe at three times after Cook had done it, I, I guess I should quickly add. So uh, that's what happened in brief to at least some aspect of the expedition after Cook was killed. Okay, so we have two more questions here. This question asks, why did Cook choose to overwinter in Hawaii? Well, his instructions always gave him latitude. They did say, uh, they did specify Petro Pavlovsk on Kamchatka, which I will highlight is about 54, 55 degrees north latitude or about what Prince George, British Columbia is. Um, and on the cold side of the Pacific, the, the, the North American side of the Pacific, because of the way the Japanese current works, uh, is actually the warmer side. So Cook had to go somewhere after he hits the ice edge in August, August of 1778. He could have gone to Kamchatka, but he thought, maybe I should go back to those islands that are just north of the equator that he had seen some of going north, but, didn't, but, but he, he thought that... Cook was, again, going back to Cook's personality, Cook hated not being busy. He had to have something to do. And more importantly, he knew for morale of his crew, the crew had to have something to do or discord and discontent and all kinds of bad morale would, would infuse the outlook of a party. So in order to make a further contribution to navigation and world geography that was not specified in his, in his instructions, I mean, no one knew what we know of, a, of the Hawaiian Islands was there, but to fill out the map of the Pacific, to keep himself and his crew busy, and to do it in a more salubrious climb. I mean, this is after all the tropical zone, not Kamchatka. Uh, that's why he overwintered there. I suppose behind the question is the premise, why didn't he go back to North America? Let's say Nootka Sound. And in fact, when he left Nootka Sound, the, the, uh, the Mawachat people there, uh, if Cook's journal and those of the other people sailing with him, if those journals are to be believed, they wanted him to come back because, I mean, Cook and these Europeans had this wondrous technology, principally iron. And so why not invite them back? But I think the Hawaiian Islands, because um, uh, uh, of its climate, the challenge of uh, surveying the islands, Cook and plotted many islands in the South Pacific here to Ford, the, the, the island group Tahiti's a part of, um, um, the uh, Tonga Islands, Fiji. So this was one more island chain that would help fill out the map uh, that he, the, the great canvas of world geography that he had begun. 
Okay, last question. Why did you pick Cook to write about? What caught your imagination to study him? Well, uh, I've, I've always been interested in exploration history. And as I look at my, the pattern of my writing, um, I, I always go back to the just previous period. So my first interest was kind of the, uh, was Isaac Stevens and the railroad survey of, of the 1850s. That was my first exploration interest. And then I became interested in the Oregon Trail, which was the 1840s. Then I became interested in Lewis and Clark and I published my first book on that topic a little more than a decade ago. And that got me interested in Alexander Mackenzie who had preceded Lewis and Clark, but farther north in the 1780s and 1790s. But Cook is, he's, Cook is the one who kind of popularized the mode of exploration, and more particularly the mode of travel writing that you see in Alexander Mackenzie's voyages from Montreal that you see, that you saw in the posthumous version of the journals of posthumous to Lewis, who died in 1809. The journals of Lewis and Clark came out in 1813 and 1814. So Cook kind of popularized this form of travel writing. In fact, until the 1850s, when the literary form known as the novel finally surpassed travel literature, travel literature, uh, I mean, Cook popularized travel literature as a literary genre, and it was the most popular form of English literature until Dickens in the late 1840s and 1850s. So, uh, so I've kind of worked backward in time uh, to uh, Cook, which is why my current writing projects has taken me back to Drake, Sir Francis Drake, Juan de Fuca, and some other navigators, some apocryphal, some real. And so the retrogression <laughs> into time with my research interest continues. All right, thank you. Well, that was the last of the discussion questions. Um, Aaron, do you have any questions? I don't. I think those were great. They were. It's my favorite part of the whole night is hearing the questions. Yes. <laughs> Mine All too. Right. Yes. <laughs> so I guess we will wrap up for tonight. Thank you again, Dave, for joining us and for your talk. And thank you for everyone who joined us for the program. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. Bye-bye.